add one of the requests to um, have an example of how to go through the story to label ADT and make sure that your student is following our strategies the right way. So I thought I would do a quick tutorial about what ADT is, why we use it, and then give you um, a practical example of one of the stories that the students are actually working through today um, and how we would use ADT just so you can see the logic behind it. So what is ADT? The A stands for action. Um, that is what the character does, right? Um, what the character is doing. So we're looking for verbs or um, actions of any kind. Usually like if it says something like Juan walked to class, that we would put a C above our character and then walked to class, we would underline. So I'll show that an example and we would label that with an A um, for action. The dialogue, I uh, have a mouth here. That is what the character says. And we always see dialogue in quotation marks. So that's a big clue. One for our students that if we see these quotation marks, uh, that it's fiction. And then second, those quotation marks tell us that it's dialogue. So it's what the character is saying. Um, and we can underline that and label it with a D. And then we have T. So T technically stands for thought and feeling. Um, and they will either label it T or F. They should know how to do this. But that um, it might say Juan was upset. And so even though was is a B verb, um, because he is talking about his emotion, we would underline that. Um, and so we wanna look at emotions, feelings, or things that are um, not tangible, like things that are beyond, like he grabbed a piece of paper. Um, wondered is, is maybe, he wondered why, um, his friend didn't come over, right? So words like that help us know how he's thinking or feeling and when we're talking about our characters. Um, so that is what ADT stands for. So when we, when we ask the students, what strategy do we use? And they say ADT, we're asking them what, why would we use that strategy? Because it tells us action, dialogue, and thought. When it's a nonfiction story or an expository text, we're not gonna have action, dialogue, and thought in the same way that we would fiction. So the only time that we are using ADT is with fiction. That is the only time we use ADT. Um, I wanna make sure that you guys know that from a parent standpoint, um, because if it is a story about bears and hibernation, we wanna make sure that they know we're using a different strategy. So I will actually make a tutorial of our second strategy that we use. This one's just focusing on ADT. Um, so we have this ADT, our action, dialogue, and thought, but why is that important? Why are we giving our students that extra step to do that? And the big reason is because we use all of these to make inferences about our character. So when I am writing or annotating the story and I label what the character is doing or what the character is saying or how the character feels, I can then use all of that text and infer how, what the, uh, something about the character, right? So if the character, um, is asking, there's dialogue about, like for example, the one we did today. Um, can this car go any faster, please? That's dialogue. Um, the store closes in 20 minutes. Then I ran out. So based on those actions and dialogue, I can infer that Andre feels rushed. So I, we want our students to get practice making those inferences. That is the skill that's gonna be tested the most um, on star tests, but let alone, that's a skill that we need as functioning humans. So we really want them to know what inferencing means and how to do it. Um, and with text for ADT, that just really helps us make those inferences. So you might hear your student, and I would really encourage you to have them say, I can infer that blank because, and this because is our text evidence. So I can infer that Andre feels rushed because he ran out the door, right? Um, that evidence supports that inference. So the because is going to be what we labeled as our ADT. So I'm going to give you a practical example of that. We're going to look at a story, um, just a short one, not too long, of what and how to use ADT, what it is and how we use it. So the first thing I always ask my students to do is just read a couple sentences and determine if we think it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, it will be fiction if it has character names, if we see dialogue, um, and if we are not seeing text features like headings. Um, so like if, if I saw this, 
bolded and underlined, but inside this box, that would be a pretty big clue that it's a nonfiction story. But because we just see paragraphs like this, I don't see any text features uh, like headings. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that this is fiction. As I read, I might be wrong and I need to go back and do a different strategy, but we always want them to get an idea of what strategy to use. So I have them write ADT at the top. That's the first thing, it just reminds them the steps that they're gonna take. And now as we read, we always, and I'm gonna write this on the bottom, so <laughs> it's like I'm teaching you in class. Um, the first step is always to um, label our characters and ADT. And then the second step is to hashtag with an inference. So those are the two basic steps that the students follow every time they are doing ADT. So those are the steps we'll follow today. Natasha looked out of her bedroom window again and again. Okay, so I see my character is a name, so I put the C above the character, and then looked out of her bedroom window again and again. Looked, is that an action, a dialogue, or a thought? Well, I don't see quotation marks, and it doesn't show me how she's feeling, so I can go ahead and mark this as action, because she's looking out, we have that verb. She could see the dog next door, sitting on a ragged and dirty blanket. Okay, so I see she, that's our character again. She could see the dog next door, sitting on a ragged, dirty blanket. Again, I have the word see, that's a verb. This is an action. I'm gonna keep reading. Light from a tall pole bounced off the tiny bits of ice that covered the grass. Natasha, Oh, and now we see our character again, but we see a different word here. Natasha thought that the little dog had to be cold. So now we see a think or a feel, right? So I have my actions and my feelings or thoughts labeled in paragraph one. Natasha looked out of her bedroom window. She could see the dog next door sitting on a dirty blanket. And Natasha thought the dog had to be cold. So what can I infer? I'm going to go back to that, right? I can infer what about Natasha? So if I look at those action dialogue and thought, okay, I can make an inference. I can infer, and then we put our hashtag on the side, that Natasha feels bad for the dog. And then I would ask the students in class, what evidence supports that Natasha feels bad? How do we know that she feels bad? Well, it says she kept looking out of her window again and again. She was looking at the dog and she thought the dog had to be cold. So she must feel bad for the dog. She must be worried that the dog is cold outside. We're gonna go ahead and keep going. It says pulling a blanket over her head, Natasha tried to go to sleep. So that's an action. The picture of the little dog out in the yard next door kept popping into her head. She threw the covers back and sat up to wipe her eyes. Mm, so now I would, I would push my students. Okay, so we have she, that's our character, Natasha. So she threw the covers back, that's an action. But do we see how Natasha's feeling? And, and we've, um, usually my students are pretty good about saying, oh, well, it says she wipes her eyes. Well, how does, how does she feel if she's wiping her eyes? One student's always gonna go, well, she's sleepy. And that could be true, right? She could be sleepy, she's wiping the sleep away from her eyes. But based on the other things I've underlined, and if we keep reading, we can go ahead and assume that Natasha feels sad, right? So let's keep reading. Natasha had to do something. This was just too sad, all right? That supports that this is a feeling, that she's wiping her eyes because she's sad or upset. So now, based on paragraph two, does that support the first hashtag that I created or do I need to make a second hashtag, right? Because we, sometimes we're gonna combine paragraphs. So if I have, she tried to go to sleep, the dog kept popping into her head, she wiped her eyes, she had to do something. So I would say the students can definitely create a second hashtag, but this still supports that Natasha feels bad for the dog. How do we know that Natasha feels bad? Well, she's wiping her eyes, right? That it kept popping into her head. So I would go ahead and I would group paragraphs one and two together with that hashtag. 
Now paragraph three, a much longer paragraph. We're gonna do a second hashtag, a second inference about the character after we learn more. In a rush, Natasha ran to her closet. So I have an action. She pulled out three thick blankets, another action. A quick trip to the garage helped her find a small cardboard box. It looked big enough to hold the dog. Now I'm going to stop the students here. Okay guys, what can we predict is going to happen? What's Natasha doing? Right? What, what, why is Natasha getting these things together? Oh, well maybe she wants to create a dog house for the dog. Maybe she's trying to keep the dog warm, right? We want to always ask those um, questions, those comprehension questions to make sure that the students are understanding. So it says it looked big enough to hold the dog. Natasha took the box and blankets and went outside. She carefully walked over to the neighbor's yard and the dog, the dog gave a short little bark. Natasha arranged the blankets inside of the box. The little dog slowly crawled into the box and settled in. All right, so now our students would say little dog, that's a character. I'm absolutely okay with them labeling that because that is the other living thing that Natasha is interacting with. So we can label that as a character. And it says the dog looked up and licked her hand. So what can I infer based on her getting these supplies, thick blankets, getting a cardboard box, um, going outside, giving them to the dog? I can infer what about Natasha? And so I would ask the questions, the students to think about that question. And then my inference might be Natasha is caring. Our hashtags always want to be words that are have to do with feeling or characteristics. Um, they're proud, they're angry, they're frustrated um, because we don't want them to just do this as a, oh, Natasha thought about the dog. Yes, Natasha did think about the dog, but we need to think beyond the text. That's an inference. It's not using just what's here. It's using what we already know and what we can uh, put together with an emotion. So here in paragraphs one and two, we can infer that she feels bad and we know that based on what we underlined. And then in paragraph three, we can infer that she's caring. Why? Because it's the middle of the night and she went and gave box and blankets to a dog for her neighbor, right? And the dog settled in, the dog was happy. So we can infer that Natasha is caring. So that's how we would use ADT in class, um, just labeling those steps, right? Um, having the students understand what action, dialogue, and thought is, and then making that inference. So those are our two steps that we would always follow. Label our characters and our ADT, and then hashtag with an inference. We're gonna use all of this when we answer our questions. And the great part is, is if your student does ADT, they're gonna have their text evidence. They're gonna answer this question, choose their answer, and they're always gonna to wanna to support it, or they should support it with text evidence. And nine times out of 10, it's something that we've already underlined. And labeled right so which idea from the story shows Natasha is worried about the dog which one shows she's worried well we already said that she feels bad so it's gonna be in paragraphs one and two if I look at my answer she tries to go to sleep that doesn't show that she's worried necessarily she pulls a blanket over her head no because that that could mean anything right it can mean she's tired um, it's too bright outside so it has to definitively prove that she's worried uh, Natasha hears the dog bark next door. Okay, so it does talk about the dog, but hearing the dog bark does not support that Natasha is worried. We need to make sure the answer supports Natasha. And it says, Natasha keeps looking out of her window at the dog. If she keeps looking, we might say that that supports that she's worried, but I need to go back into my story just to make sure. So it says she looked out of her bedroom window again and again, she could see the dog and right here, she thought the little dog had to be cold. We said all of those supported that she feels bad for the dog. So my text evidence might be that last sentence in paragraph one. Um, Natasha thought the little dog had to be cold. And that is how your student would follow the steps for ADT. I always want them to have text evidence. The only instance where they wouldn't have it is 
potentially with questions like this. So in question four, all the answers are italicized or slanted. And so this is actual evidence from the text. So if they choose this, right, which sentence shows that she is sad? Well, this is the evidence from the text. So their answer is their text evidence. Um, this is the only instance when I don't want them writing something down. But what they could do if they choose the answer is G, right? And it says it wipe, wipes her eyes. They could support it by saying she was crying, right? Because we can infer if she's wiping her eyes that she was crying. Nine times out of 10, when you're crying, it's because you're sad. So um, the text evidence is going to be less um, supportive in questions like this than we see in question three. But I always want them to have something that shows why they chose that answer. Um, starting next week on Monday, not only will they have to choose the answer on the Google form, but there will be a box underneath each question where they'll have to type in what evidence they found. So I really want to push that I want your students to support with text evidence because we, we know that this, we're in this for the long haul. This is going to be school till the end of the year um, unless IDEA changes the, what they've sent out. And so we want to make sure that we're still making our students push themselves and try a little harder um, to follow the same steps we would if they were in the classroom with me. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. I can do this one-on-one. -on -one. I can hold a small Zoom conference and go over it again, but I'm hoping that this video uh, will help you guys a little bit so that way you guys, when you're doing this at home with your students or checking the work, you know what to look for. And I just wanna say I really appreciate you guys. I know that you are um, juggling maybe a couple kids and you're working from home um, and you're not used to this. This is an adjustment for all of us. So you are doing the best that you can and I'm proud of you guys and thank you so much um, for supporting us please feel free to reach out with any questions and I hope that this helped you guys.